Welcome everybody back to another OTD Canadian Military History live stream. Having a repeat guest on who now has the honor of having his old playlist <laughs> of live streams. He's one of the two, uh, which is awesome now. Uh, always lots of good topics. Cover the gambit. It's all linked down below. Um, I'm sure most of you know who he is by now. It, uh, Dave Gribstad has written on, see if I get these right off the top of my head without him interfering because he's muted. Falcons, Winnipeg Falcons at war. Uh, we did Veritable, the fire pan for Veritable, uh, and uh, the Canadian garrison at Winnipeg, at Red River. And today is fourth with the fire uh, artillery generally at Vimy Ridge. I hope I got all those right. <laughs> Uh, that's all four of them. So yeah, so I've I've had an advanced copy of the book. It's really good. Uh, lots of detail. If you're into the artillery stuff, if and if you're not, if you're into the Vimy Ridge stuff, it's good. I really like it. Um, and yes, I'm probably biased because I'm a little verb about it, but I don't care. Uh, I think it's good. And that's why I did it because it's good and anything we'll get into it. But I just want to say that before Dave comes on that I do really like this book. And as I said in my little thing that will appear later, it's a breath of fresh air because I do literally believe that. And uh, we'll talk about why that is. So thanks for coming back on. Uh, it's great to have you on again. Well, thanks for having me. And, and thanks for those kind words. I'm, I'm glad you enjoy it so much. Yeah, and you're right. I think you hit all the, the key things we, uh, we've talked about since there. This is number four. If I understand correctly, you told me I get a set of, a set of steak knives after number five. Is that, is <laughs> yeah, I got to I gotta put the order in for those uh, okay. before, you, uh, before we schedule that one. <laughs> it's actually not, you know, with the little OTD symbol on the handle. That wouldn't be a, probably could make that happen. Yeah, probably good swag. Good. good swag. Yeah, probably look pretty good. Actually, it's a pretty condensed logo. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so um, yeah, having you back on. Of course, those of you who don't know, well, I guess I can uh, let you introduce yourself. But obviously, you have a connection to the artillery. I'm sure most of those watching live, maybe not later on, but will know your background. So if you just want to. Quickly, real quick, again, give us the background, uh, your personal yeah. background, if you can, just for those who might not know you. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much. So uh, Dave Grabstead's the name. And as we mentioned, I've been on your show before and thoroughly enjoyed it. And before we go any further, I just want to say thanks to you for the uh, the great work that you do spreading, uh, shedding light on on really important topics in Canadian military history. So it's, uh, you, you know, I think a lot of people are interested in it, but they they only get the wave tops and you kind of really dive into the the details, which is, I think, thoroughly important. And when you see some of the the, the, the people who have come on your uh, on your chat here and shared those important points, it, you're doing it. it you're, you're, you're the content you produce is absolutely fantastic. So thanks for doing that. Oh, well, thank you for the, for the <laughs> kind words. Nice <laughs> no to hear. Uh, so as I mentioned, yeah, as you mentioned, yeah, I'm in the, I'm in the artillery. I'm a serving artillery officer in the army. I've been uh, in the artillery for now. Uh, well, in November it'll be 33 years since I enlisted in the artillery, I spent nine years in the reserves and uh, spent, uh, well, uh, you know, 34 in that, uh, or sorry, 24 in the regular forms once, uh, once we hit November. Um, and uh, some experience in one RCHA and two RCHA, I did a battery command tour uh, and five years at the school. So uh, if, if you're not familiar with the school, uh, you, uh, I was an instructor in gunnery at the artillery school. So you take a, a nine month course there, which is referred to lovingly as those who take the course as the masters of artillery. And it's very intense nine month, nine, actually 10 month course, uh, learning all the technical details uh, of, of, of the artillery. And there, there's the instructor in gunnery and the assistant instructor in gunnery course. The assistant instructor in gunnery is for the NCMs and they're very much more details oriented. So the uh, the the uh, the mechanisms of the gun. Uh, they're experts on like how a fuse works and, and how uh, uh, and how uh, projectiles work. For example, we get a smattering of that, but the officers obviously focus more on organization, tactics, techniques, procedures, drills, and whatnot. And there's obviously some crossover there, but uh, all that is to say, uh, that's my kind of artillery uh, artillery background, uh, and I've just got a passion for military history, but. Uh, uh, artillery, military history, in in, in particular. And I don't want to. Uh, I know I've got a slide that, uh, that addresses this specifically about why I wrote this, but uh, you know, I, I want to tell the story of the uh, of the artillery because I think a lot of times it gets overshadowed. Not so much well overshadowed, but also elements of it just don't get told. Period. Right. Uh, and uh, and when you look at the artillery as a system, as an interconnected interconnected system. Uh, in which everything is dependent on everything else uh, to work fun to function perfectly. It's, it's important to know all those parts. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah. Yeah. Sorry to jump in. I mean, I no obviously problem. agree with that because I'm reading this book and then 
I was reading it on the way to go visit the veritable battlefields, which we had previously talked about. Mm -hmm. So you, you got, and well, I mean, Dave is watching and the gunners, you guys are everywhere. You guys get in my head. So it's all mm -hmm. in there now. So I'll be a performer. I've, I've said it before. We're ubiquitous. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Everywhere. Yeah, somewhere. I don't, I can't remember. <laughs> but I, the, and the last point I want to add is that I'm very honored uh, since June 30th, I've been very honored to be the regimental colonel of the Royal Regiment of Canadian Artillery. So I'm responsible working with the Colonel Commandant Dave Patterson and uh, the regimental headquarters uh, to, uh, to celebrate our heritage, to connect with Canadians and to uh, develop the family institution. So I've got a, not just a passion for artillery, history, but it's also just a passion for uh, the artillery writ large as, as a regimental family. Yeah, we got the uh, pun intended, the big hitters <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> connected to ODD, which is amazing, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so yeah, I'll pull up the uh, the, uh, sure. the slide. <laughs> Couldn't get that word out. There we go. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah, so that's uh, uh, that's the title slide, but uh, more importantly, it's, it's the bottom two thirds or so of uh, the cover of my upcoming book. And uh, I should have put a warning on all the slides here. Is it warning, uh, shame of self-promotion to follow? <laughs> and so, yeah, so that's one of the reasons I asked if I could chat about this is because uh, in a couple days, the book is being uh, released. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm out here trying to, to stir up interest in it. And uh, today we're going to talk about, I won't uh, read it cover to cover, but I'll hit some <laughs> of the wave tops and, and hopefully whet everybody's appetite so they rush out and buy five, 10, 15. I mean, it'll make a great Christmas gift. So, <laughs> you know, buy a whole bunch of copies of this going forward. Yeah. Hit, hit the, hit the extended family. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so some of the questions, one of the biggest questions I get is where did you get the name from? So I know I, I've put a few social media posts out about it, but I'll, I'll hit it here. So of course, uh, like anyone, I, I went, well, let's go see if Shakespeare said anything about cannons. Uh, and, uh, and there it is, but there's more to it. So, so I took this, uh, I found this quote and you got to love the internet because I didn't have to read all of Shakespeare till I find a, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> some, oh, yeah. uh, a reference to cannons, but I can control F cannon. Hey, there we go. Uh, so I, I stumbled upon this. So it's from the, uh, the play King John uh, act two scene one. Uh, and the cannons have their bowels full of wrath and ready mounted are they to spit forth their iron indignation against your wall. So that's where iron indignation comes from. I'll give you a little bit of the background to the story. And first of all, David O'Keefe uh, kind of highlighted this when I mentioned it on the first time I shared this quote on, uh, on social media. And yeah, for a period, I did want to, I thought I'd name this bowels of wrath uh, that would maybe a good uh, a good title for the book but uh, i was convinced otherwise that, uh, <laughs> so i went with iron indignation instead uh, but uh, bowels of wrath i think there's a book in there too that can be that can be used in a in a in sometime in the future uh, but nonetheless a book but maybe <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh so anyway i took it so uh, if you haven't read King John, and I haven't, I just uh, kind of got the Coles notes about what the scene is all about. But essentially, uh, in the 13th century, when uh, Normandy was, uh, was still under the control of, of England, uh, there, there was a town called Angiers, and uh, the king of, uh, of uh, England, who was King John, uh, and the king of France, who was King Philip, but king, uh, both uh, appeared before the walls of Angiers, uh, trying to convince the uh, the inhabitants to open their doors and let them in, and uh, at the time Philip was uh, actually didn't recognize John as the king, and he had he supported another contender for the crown. Uh, so here King John is telling, and, and in my mind it's it's like that that French knight from uh, Monty Python, uh, you know, kind of hanging over the uh, hanging yeah. over the edge of the castle. But in the play, obviously, you can envision there was one person who represented the townsfolk of Angiers, kind of looking out over the wall. And uh, King John was actually referring to the French here and said, even though the French have come here uh, to uh, uh, to parley with you and to and to negotiate with you, their cannons have, have their bowels full of wrath, meaning they're loaded and they're ready mounted. Are they to spit forth their iron indignation against your walls? So he was basically saying, I know they're saying they're talking a big game, but they actually want to blow you up. Uh, and that kind of resonated with me because, um, and I think it's apropos here, uh, it, because what we're going to talk about with the, the barrage and the bombardment of Vimy Ridge was essentially a siege operation. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit later, but by the time of the spring offensive in 1917, uh, the... Uh, 
it was it, it wasn't there weren't castles anymore, but uh, they were essentially fighting siege warfare. Uh, so that's what the artillery was used for. And they weren't battering down walls, as in the case of King John, but they were battering down uh, defenses, whether it be wire or, or trench emplacements or whatnot. So uh, notwithstanding the, the alliteration of iron indignation, and it just sounds cool that uh, <laughs> the it was um, uh, it resonated in that uh, the, the, what we're seeing at Vimy Ridge is an actual siege operation. And not just at Vimy Ridge, like essentially from August, I think, or well, from fall 1914 up until that point, it was just uh, siege warfare is what trench warfare was. And of course, I have the, the, the quote uh, set against uh, Michael Jack's uh, uh, painting, the famous painting. I saw you shared a picture that, uh, that, that famous painting in the War Museum. You yeah. shared a picture of it the other day, uh, Michael Jack's painting, the, the taking of Vimy Ridge, uh, Easter Easter Sunday, 1917. So it's, it's a great painting. And of course, the 4.5 inch howitzer figures prominently in the picture. So yeah, yeah, it's I mean, it, the scale of the painting literally itself, because that my picture is literally of the painting as it hangs in the mm -hmm. museum down the Le Breton Gallery. The thing that always stands out to me, though, is this guy is shirtless. I just that doesn't yeah. that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Way too well, cold. <laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty cold. You're right. And it was snowing. Uh, but, yeah. uh, you, you know, uh, it, it, it was hot work, certainly when you're you're firing for hours oh, at a time. It, yeah, it's uh, I can see you may be getting a little fatigued, but you're absolutely right. Uh, they attacked into the teeth of a snowstorm. So whether or not uh, <laughs> it was wise to <laughs> disrobe in that manner, I don't know. Anyway, all right. Anyway, here we go. OK, so there's the full cover. Uh, so when everybody orders their copy, that's what they're going to get in the mail. Uh, and uh, so here's the agenda. I won't read through the uh, the agenda in, in in great detail, but these are some of the things I'm going to touch on as we talk. Yeah, just leave that up there for a second for people sure. to give a gander. But yeah, it's a great cover. I really liked it when you first sent it to me as as a preview to the preview. I was I was really I wasn't sure what you were going to do right because you hadn't told me. So mm -hmm. it, it was just it was awesome to see. So so yeah. it, it's really well done. I really like it. I like the color contrast. And, and you know, I'd love to take credit for it, uh, and uh, uh, but sadly, I can't. It was the, the great team, and I wish I knew the, the name of the cover designer. But uh, one of Phil's team at Double Dagger Books, they actually designed the cover. I actually pitched uh, a little bit of a backstory here. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to talk about it, but uh, I actually pitched using uh, that painting from the last slide as, as right. the cover. I thought that would be perfect, and Phil, Phil agreed. Uh, but uh, they're also in the process of, of I think, pre reprinting the Gunners of Canada uh, oh, okay. books. And, uh, and the last iteration of that had that painting as a cover. So sadly, I was uh, I was undercut by my own team, essentially. <laughs> and uh, uh, ah. so uh, the RCAA, who's, who's, who's coordinating this reprint of the Gunners of Canada, they, uh, we went, they, they got priority for the use of that image. Eh, but, like but it is a great image there. I it's think. Different. I, I, I mean, that's. I mean, maybe we can talk about that for me. People know my thoughts on Vimy, but I like it's different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so here we go. Okay, and again, so I put a lot of words there, but I'm not going to read them out. But uh, yeah. so I, I, I wrote this book, and I touched on these points during our veritable talk a little while back, and said mm -hmm. the the artillery system is is whenever it's, or the artillery, whenever it's dealt with in historical books, unless it is written specifically for an artillery audience, it, it's dealt with only very sparingly. And, 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 uh, and for example, it's almost, all, all that's focused on is the number of guns and how long the barrage was if we're talking about the First or Second World War. Uh, and, and every now and again, they'll touch on some of the other elements of it, but, uh, but there's more to the story. And uh, we're going to see that there was over 800 guns that were part of the, uh, the core artillery that fired on Vimy Ridge uh, and over 45,000 men. And there was, all, there was these, so literally tens of thousands, not just men, but other elements, and, and we'll touch on this, that, that made up this huge system that uh, uh, it was this network of individual bits that all had to work in sync in order to achieve, achieve their aims, uh, whether it's uh, horses, men, uh, airplanes, horses, uh, sorry, I mentioned horses already, uh, the, the type of projectile, the ammo resupply, you name it. Uh, yeah. So this massive organization, and it, it isn't, I understand that it's not, it's not riveting stuff. Uh, so, you know, when you start reading the narrative of a platoon assault on a machine gun nest, for example, vice a artillery resupply uh, run, you know, that it's, uh, one's a page turner, one isn't. But I think the men who did that 
they deserve to have their time in the sun too, because uh, it may not have been, let's use the word glorious. I don't know if that's the right word, but I think you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, no. But it was necessary. Like none of none of this would have none of this would have come off without the the folks that did that. All those tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of individual actions that had to come off uh, in, in order for this to, to work. Uh, and the last point uh, is that tactically, the, the spring offensive was the first time the Allies had sufficient amount of gun, of men and guns, as well as a sufficient amount and type of projectiles to return some modicum of maneuver to the battlefield. Uh, and the, the philosophy behind fire support that existed at the start of the war compared to what we see in the spring offensive of 1917 is completely different. Like, like you wouldn't, it would almost be the point uh, that a gunner of, if he had been, you know, a time traveler to 1917, wouldn't comprehend how almost the, the artillery was functioning uh, at Vimy Ridge or the, the broader Arras, uh, Arras offensive uh, compared to what was happening uh, in the opening phases of, of the war. Absolutely, completely different. So we went from, uh, you know, once the initial phase of maneuver ended, uh, and uh, the front lines were established and, and we started adopting this siege warfare mentality or philosophy or doctrine. Uh, everybody still wanted to maneuver, but yeah. they couldn't. Uh, and, uh, and it wasn't until uh, it, it wasn't until after years of industrial output, training, you name it, that there was, as I mentioned here, all these resources available to actually re return some degree of mo uh, of maneuverability to the uh, uh, to the battlefield. Yep. So I think we can advance there. Hmm. So um, yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just I'll just touch on some of these, and these are some of the for everyone who's watching. I've kind of structured this talk uh, along the same lines as. The chapters and sections of the book, uh, yep. but I needn't kind of uh, recite every single point. But um, just these are just some points uh, on about artillery because t artillery is necessarily, or as you understand, a technical arm, and it's mm -hmm. got uh, te technical components that need to be under uh, understood as to why it functions the way it does. Uh, and because we're going to hit on some of these throughout our talk here tonight, and maybe there'll be some questions about it, I'll, I'll hit on some of these things. And just for general knowledge as well, I know I touched on some of them during the veritable chat, but I'll, I'll rehash it very quickly here. So direct and indirect fire. Uh, it's pretty simple. A direct fire uh, means you can see what you're shooting at. So uh, essentially, it's also referred to at times as firing over open sites. And when we start talking about doctrine, uh, that was... Kind of that's that's how it was done in 1914 in the opening phases. Indirect fire was known, uh, and uh, they could do it, but nobody liked it, and uh, mm -hmm. and they thought. Yeah. And in fact, not just didn't they, they didn't like it in, in certain uh, in certain sections. It was considered ungentlemanly. Mm -hmm. uh, but so direct fire. Imagine a cannon rolls up, uh, unlimbers, the gunners jump out with haste, uh, point the gun at the enemy. They they look through their sights and they pull the lantern and the round goes down range and they're shooting at the enemy, whether it's uh, bad artillery or, or bad infantry. Indirect is a, a different, is a completely different approach in which uh, the gunners, as you can see from the photo here, they're either behind a tree line, behind a hill, uh, any sort of intervening feature where they can't see the, the target. Uh, so it, it it necessitates, it increases the complexity, increases the demand on uh, command or the demand on command and control, pardon me. Uh, and it slows things down, obviously. But uh, for the gunners, it means they don't get shot at and, uh, and they, they can survive a little bit more. Right. So uh, you can imagine a gunner, uh, and I know a lot of inf infantry soldiers, well, they were kind of roll their eyes at this, but they when they started to hear in the the buzz of bullets about their ears and stuff like that, because at this point, um, an artillery uh, battery that that unlimbered in direct in, in direct fire mode and were engaging the infantry, uh, they could probably be engaged by the infantry rifles as well. So they didn't really care for that, and uh, uh, obviously, so uh, eventually, as they adopted the siege warfare approach, uh, both sides the artillery slowly moved away uh, into these covered positions, covered concealed positions, uh, and they had to fire indirectly. So that's the difference between direct and indirect. And of course, not only is command and control challenged, but now you need somebody 
to be forward to observe, uh, and that's what we'll talk about next, uh, observe the fall shot and radio or via telephone wire in this case, um, uh, send corrections back to the battery so that uh, they move the fall shot. Because obviously the gunners can't see where the bullets are landing, so they can't change it themselves. So you need some sort of command or command post to calculate the corrections trigonum trigonometrically uh, to, uh, to make sure the bullet the bullets hit the uh, the target. Yep. Uh, adjusted and predicted is is as it sounds. So you have that observer who adjusts the uh, the fall of the shot. So he sees the round land here and the target's here. So he he sends orders so that it lands on the target. Uh, and uh, so that's adjusted. And in modern parlance, we, we refer to it as did hit uh, data as in we fired and we hit the target. So record it. Next time we want to hit that target, fire it at the same data. Uh, predicted fire, though, is something completely different. It is where you, uh, you say the battery is here, the target is here. Uh, and so according to our tabular firing tables and all of our calculations, uh, we have to fire at this charge at this elevation and this bearing in order for it to hit, hit the target. And we predict with all these calculations that it's actually going to hit the target. Uh, so um, uh, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't used in, uh, in, the, in Vimy Ridge. Uh, the science had developed to the point that accurate predicted fire could be used at Vimy Ridge. Uh, but it wasn't. Uh, nobody was. Nobody's willing to rely on it. In fact, it, it was no less than Haig himself who said, uh, "No, no predicted fire. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you need to. You need to actually uh, right. watch it, adjusted fire or adjust that fire. Or it's also known as registered as well. Yes. Uh, errors. Uh, so you'll often hear gunners talking about errors. That doesn't mean necessarily that somebody made a mistake. It's just that uh, for there, there is millions of different. Uh, uh, elements of the environment, whether it's the the, the, uh, the temperature of the barrel, the temperature of the charge bag, uh, the, the wind gusts that will affect uh, a bullet in flight and no two bullets will land in the same uh, in the same location uh, twice. That's why they always used to tell soldiers that if you're being shelled, jump in a sh in a shell <laughs> hole because <Yeah. laughs> the chances chances are there's another bullet isn't going to land there. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, and, and all these multitude of errors uh, come in, and those are all non-standard conditions. So the bullet, uh, you can fire a hundred rounds uh, at the same target with without changing the barrel or like the the elevation or bearing of the barrel, and you will get an oblong beaten zone around the target with. Uh, no two shells landing exactly in the same location. Uh, and, and again, we discussed this during our veritable talk. Uh, artillery does three things. It suppresses, it neutralizes, and destroys. Suppressing just means very briefly, It uh, imagine an, an enemy infantry soldier just kind of ducking down and, and hiding in the bottom of the trench. Uh, but then right away, as soon as kind of the echo of the incoming round fades, he gets up again and he starts returning fire. So that was that's kind of suppression. It's very, very fleeting and doesn't last long. Neutralizing, there's a little bit more damage, more casualties are caused, but the uh, the enemy can, you know, they can quickly, uh, with a little bit of reinforcement, they can they can continue doing their uh, uh, their work and uh, and destroy as it implies it's it's gone. And the the unit, if a unit is destroyed, it it ceases to be a combat combat effective until it's actually replaced. Uh, same with an individual, that rifleman of that section is now gone until a reinforcement comes. And I saw Ryan's comment there. Yes, it's a it's an area weapon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, guns, mortars, and howitzers. Uh, so the, the term gun is now used, and even in the First World War, it was used for everything. Although, generally speaking, a gun very technically uh, could fire at a more flat rate. So it didn't have much of an elevation, not much of a... Uh, uh, of a bearing change. Um, uh, a mortar, uh, as if those who know, fires only at high angles, so no less than 45 degrees. It's great for firing up and over obstacles and coming down at a very steep angle of fall. Uh, and howitzers. Howitzers are like guns, only they have certain uh, devices uh, on them that allow them to elevate the barrel beyond 45 degrees, so they can fire almost like a mortar. Uh, uh, but uh, um, but they can also fire like a gun at a more flatter elevation as well. So, uh, so that's just. Uh, but if you just refer to, with the exception of mortar, really, if you refer to anything as a gun, it, people know what you're talking about anyway. Pretty much, yeah. Mm -hmm. At least I've been told that, and when I've made the errors in multiple times. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I didn't realize how much of an eye chair that was. So I apologize <laughs> to everybody there. You are, okay, so. you are, I'll say this again about the book and not in a bad way, because when you're reading it, it, it makes sense why you did it that way. It's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's comprehensive. And uh, honestly, I like it because hey, I'm just me and the history nerd, as you all know, but it, it just, it, it, I think it was a good refresher. I mean, maybe not for this kind of forum, but in the book, mm -hmm. it was, I liked it. Yeah, so I have a chapter, just a very short history of the RCA, and again, I won't go through this in detail, but uh, the only intent was to kind of tell you about, because it's not just the technical history of the artillery, I wanted to kind of uh, bang the drum a bit about the, uh, the artillery, so, um, and, and part of it was also to, to show that uh, the the Canadian artillery and the Royal Artillery uh, are, share so many, we, we basically just adopted all of their traditions uh, wholesale. We have the same flag, we have the same cat badge, we have the same motto. We even we even ex we even accepted uh, the, the birthday of the Royal Artillery as Artillery Day in Canada. Uh, and we share this kind of Commonwealth uh, approach to the artillery and the Aussies and the, and the Kiwis do they do the same. We all kind of have this this international artillery commonality amongst us. And it may seem quaint in that we have the same cap badge and, and we all kind of say the same, um, say the same things, the same fire discipline, the same orders and whatnot. Uh, but that had value during the First World War. And as we'll see with Vimy Ridge, uh, for every one, for every brigade of, our, of Canadian artillery, there were four or five brigades of British artillery. There were South, there was South African artillery. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and from time to time, uh, you, you know, artillery was the big kind of uh, the extra punch that any commander could give to the infantry. So you would have uh, Canadian artillery, British artillery, uh, Aussie, you, you name it, moving around and supporting Commonwealth Imperial uh, um, operations. So because of that, uh, because we had that common culture, it was a lot easier to just kind of slide in there and work next to them. Uh, and, uh, and so everybody, like the Imperial Artillery, with, with minor changes, uh, uh, the Imperial Artillery had a common culture. Uh, so essentially you had artillery support, whether it was Canadian, British, Australian, whatever, uh, but everybody was singing from the same songbook. So, so it is important. Uh, again, I won't, uh, I won't highlight this, but the artillery has been around since some of the batteries predate Confederation. And of course, we just celebrated the 150th anniversary of the creation of A&V batteries, which I argue were the first permanent <laughs> elements of the Canadian Army. Uh, millions yeah. disagree, but... Uh, okay. Okay. We're not yeah. doing that today. <laughs> I can get but, you all on and we can fight later. Yeah, uh, but a key point I, I just, I'll, I'll hit I'll hit on here before we go forward yeah. is in the 18... Uh, did I write it down? Oh, yeah. 1 July 1899... Uh, the kind of schism uh, of of uh, uh, of the Royal Artillery between the Mounted Branch and the Dismounted Branch. Yeah. yeah. So the Royal Field and Artillery and the Royal Horse Artillery, which is what those acronyms stand for, and the Royal Garrison Artillery separated at that point uh, and did not rejoin into a single regiment uh, really until after the Great War. Yeah. But it's not so the Royal Field Artillery, Royal Horse Artillery were the, the field guns, the uh, uh, the 18 pounders, 13 pounders that supported the infantry and cavalry units. The dismounted branch of the RGA, they had the, the siege, medium, heavy, heavy guns, 60 pounders, six inch uh, guns, you name it. Uh, and of course, also the coastal guns. So it wasn't just the fact that uh, the dismounted branch had bigger guns, uh, there's a there was a philosophical difference between them as well. Mm -hmm. So in the mounted branch, this is where that doctrine comes from that we, we talked to or uh, talked about late, earlier, pardon me, uh, that uh, they uh, they were full of a land. They, they would gallop yeah. forward, un, unhook the guns uh, and, and fire uh, if, and, and fire over direct sights at the target. Whereas the, the garrison artillery branch, uh, because they were uh, they were firing at uh, more precise they were they were supposed to destroy destroy like uh, pillboxes and stuff, so they had to be more precise. Uh, the coastal uh, guns had to shoot at a, a ship in the sea, for example. So they started taking these measurements for wind velocity, air density, and stuff. They started making those calculations, and uh, and in the mounted branch, uh, everybody kind of turned their nose up to them. Uh, 
and and, and uh, there's a great quote in the book where uh, you know we uh, nobody would nobody would ever pause to actually calculate uh, wind speed or anything like that that would just be too uh, take too long uh, and they they saw anything that was any gun that was drawn by anything other than a horse is beneath contempt and yeah. uh, so they would never they would yeah. never actually it was all about elon speed of engagement and uh, and it took it took sadly a lot of uh, a lot of blood to be spilled before people realized. Well, maybe that isn't the best way. Uh, but that's the key thing I want to hit there. And then there's just some key points in, in artillery history there. Uh, but I do want to hit uh, point out that in 1913, you know, we had the famous mobilization scheme. Uh, but it, based on that, in 1911, uh, no less than General French, who would you know go on to bigger and big, bigger and better things during the Great War. He, he traveled to Canada and did an assessment and said, here, this is what you need to have the proper artillery. Uh, yeah. And the Canadian government said, sure, let's do it. Let's, uh, let's rearm with all this artillery. But sadly, when war broke out, uh, uh, you know, in, 19, or in 1914, you know, by the time of that, we were short uh, 284 guns and houses from the 1913 mobilization scheme that we had developed. Uh, so once again, just to set the scene, I think everybody everybody yeah. knows what happened. I won't belabor the point, uh, but uh, some guy was driving around Sarajevo and got shot, and uh, that led to this, and that led to that, and, uh, exactly. uh, and next thing you know, everybody's uh, some damn fool thing in the Balkans created the uh, uh, yeah. the Great War. And uh, but the key thing here, obviously, is uh, because of the competing. Uh, 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 alliances there. Once, uh, once the Germans uh, crossed into Belgium, uh, they kind of violated the, the guarantee of neutrality that the British had given to Belgium. So the British were then kind of compelled for strategic reasons uh, to declare war. And of course, once they declared war, they um, uh, Canada was at, at war as well. Uh, so we met the we met the call to war with uh, with a lot of fervor. Uh, and I, I won't go through the whole mobilization, obviously, but I think everybody's aware that a lot of recruits signed up. There was a lot of toing and froing and competing plans and miscommunications and greasing of palms and favors done and uh, special shovels developed and all sorts of other things <laughs> that eventually led to the uh, the first uh, the first contingent sailing overseas uh, and and. Um, uh, and eventually moving to France, which we'll touch on here in a bit. Uh, but one point I will I, I will highlight here is you, you can see that uh, the the this plan, the Schleifen plan that uh, the Germans adopted, it's amazing how those strategic intents bubble down into how the uh, the German army was was organized and and, right. and armed. Yep. So when it comes to the German artillery arm, they actually had a lot more howitzers, for example, and a lot more heavier guns than the British artillery did. And the reason was is because they knew this was the plan and they knew there were fortresses all on the way. And they knew that heavier guns and howitzers would be required to reduce those forces. So consequently, uh, the German artillery was from, I guess, pound for pound wise, uh, had, had more of a more of a punch than the imperial artillery uh, right. at, at the start of the war. At the start of the war, anyway. Uh, and uh, but you can see because this was all hinged on maneuver, uh, that that philosophy that uh, that started the war uh, of uh, of direct fire and uh, and guns firing from open positions and whatnot. You can understand why it was still in vogue, and it wasn't until everything kind of right. ground to a halt that's when it, they realized that it didn't work anymore. So I yeah, I was going to say, I was going to hope you're going to mention that the, the forts, mm -hmm. particularly the Belgian forts. I think the, uh, yeah, it's mentioned here, the guns of August. I mean, I read that a long time ago, but I mean, the book has some problems, but it, it highlights the, the, the exactly what you're talking about, the German development of their doctrine, because while they had the initiative, you know, the whole Belgian neutrality causing a world war thing aside, <laughs> they knew <laughs> what the game was going to be. So I think, yeah, that, that's important to mention uh, for this, if uh, we can go forward. Yeah, of course, please. Yeah, so and so uh, my next chapter just kind of very very briefly touches on some of the engagements and 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 how the Canadian Corps grew from one division to eventually four divisions by the time we hit uh, Vimy Ridge. Well, almost four divisions because uh, most people don't realize. And we we talk about Vimy Ridge. I know I'm digressing here, uh, 
as being the first time that the four Canadian divisions uh, served together, which is partially true. Uh, but as we'll see a little later on, that an, an integral part part of the uh, of a division is the divisional artillery. It's uh, yep. and the the fourth Canadian divisional artillery uh, was not mobilized and came into the line until June of 1917 after Vimy Ridge. So actually, uh, the fourth Canadian division had the infantry aspect, uh, but it was supported by what was then called the reserve divisional artillery, which is a uh, uh, British artillery, actually, which started as the Lahore Divisional Artillery. Yes, it so it started as an Indian artillery, yep. uh, right. uh, divisional artillery, and then eventually became the Reserve Divisional yeah, Artillery. And had supported Canada, sorry, jump in, but had supported Canada before. Uh, oh, certainly. Yeah, it was uh, because uh, the the Lahore Division was, was actually sent to the Middle East, but left the guns behind. Yep. So uh, they they were masterless for to a degree, I guess, and so it became kind of this uh, this fire support unit that kind of bobbed around and uh, was plugged mm -hmm. in here and here. And, and eventually the uh, the number of, I guess, actual Indian gunners who were manning it or, or the, whatever constituted the Lahore uh, Divisional Artillery uh, had either been wounded or, or killed to the point where they just said, we're just going to call it the Reserve Divisional Artillery because it, it, its connection with Lahore is no, really doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so just a, a few points. So as we know, we uh, the first Canadian division was involved in New Chapelle, not not, not greatly, but uh, I will point out here. Uh, I said it's the first use of the barrage by the Brits, uh, and I don't want I don't want anybody to get angry with me. The barrage was known before this. In fact, even in even in the South African War, there were attempts to fire barrages then, so it wasn't wholly new. But New Chapelle was was kind of one of the first times that. Um, uh, that a real like a, a coordinated rolling barrage was planned and used and it didn't go didn't go great but it was kind of the first the first chance that uh, that they had to, to use it uh, and uh, and in, interesting despite how early it was in the uh, in the conflict um, the it, the actual guns per yard used in New Chapelle was was greater than the song. Uh, but it was because the number of guns firing in the, in the front of the the attack was actually quite narrow, yeah. uh, so it was it was quite intense. But uh, the command and control uh, and the familiarity that infantry artillery kind of liaison wasn't fully established at the point that they could make best use of it there. So it was used then, but it wasn't a resounding success. Uh, yeah. However, nonetheless, uh, the barrage eventually became the means by which uh, any assault had to be used. Uh, so we know that uh, the Canadians were involved in Ypres and in St. Eloy and, uh, and then later in Mount Sorrel. And uh, Mount Sorrel is the only instance during the Great War when yep. the Canadian artillery lost guns, but they were eventually recovered. But two guns were, were over, overwhelmed, being served by engineers and gunners, uh, and they fought to the last man. Uh, both crews were killed. I think there was even a, like a, a, an officer section commander. There was you know, Everyone was killed. The guns were captured, but eventually during one of the counterattacks, they were they were recovered. Yep. Uh, and then the Somme and Verdun. So uh, not, not necessarily here to talk about the Somme and Verdun, but by this point in July of 1916, uh, or at least the, the spring and summer of 1916, we're starting to see the masses of guns and ammunition getting to the point that we will see in the spring offensive uh, in, uh, in, in April of 1917. So obviously everybody knows about the Somme, that it was a massive battle. Uh, barrages were were used there. The, the amount of ammunition had increased, uh, but still not enough. Uh, and uh, command and control had not yet been perfected. And by that, I mean the, the command and control of artillery and infantry coordination. Uh, there were definitely some gaps there. Uh, well, as I say there, my last point, uh, coordinating fires and maneuver had not yet been perfected. Uh, and and it was the same at Verdun. So it's, a, it's of interest then that, uh, and I know I suggested, I, I saw somebody uh, picked it up and hopefully we'll see this soon, but uh, uh, it, it's interesting that a lot of the lessons from the Somme and Verdun were applied in in the spring offensive, and so in Vimy Ridge and the Arras. So, uh, and we know for the Canadian Corps uh, that uh, that Curry was was dispatched uh, you know, to the French Army to collect lessons learned from the French and, and to collect lessons later from, uh, from what happened in the Somme. And those were all applied uh, in, the, in the spring offensive in 1917. Uh, and, uh, and of course, by this point, uh, even it hadn't been fully recouped, but we, we haven't touched yet on the shell crisis 
of 1915. So uh, I don't have the numbers to hand, but with the, the philosophy that the artillery had at the outbreak of the First World War, uh, each gun was a allocated 1,500 rounds for the first six months yeah. of the war. Uh, and then the, the British anticipated that after six months, there'll be another 500 rounds per gun available. Uh, and, and that's total, not per day, that's total number yeah. of rounds. Oh. And of yeah. course, when, when we get to uh, Vimy Ridge, uh, you'll see like there's... Uh, yeah. Uh, some guns are firing that in a day, uh, yeah. for example, and yeah. it's, uh, uh, well, maybe not that much, but certainly uh, a lot. And uh, so, a lot, yeah. yeah. Well, so yeah. The, anyway, we can get to that, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And so the industry, you know, if, if you're not familiar with the shell crisis, anybody who's watching this, uh, they realized they didn't have shells. In fact, the, the gun, there were more guns than shell, maybe not more guns than shells, but the limiting factor wasn't guns at one point in late no. 15, 16, it was actually a lack of shells. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a huge crisis, and that's why it's called the shell crisis, and a huge scandal as well. Like an entire, the British government fell on this. Oh, and yep. uh, and it wasn't until they turned that around and industry started pumping out the, a sufficient number of rounds uh, required to, uh, uh, that, uh, that we got to the point and we see in the spring of 1917 that uh, we could actually use artillery to return maneuver to the battlefield. Okay. Yep. I think we'll awesome. go forward next. All right. So, uh, so a big part of my book is discussing ends, means, means and ways uh, to give an idea. So even, even though I focused a lot on Vimy Ridge, uh, as the subtitle of the book mentions, it's all about the evolution of artillery tactics. Uh, so, uh, and this is where we get into the parts that I talked about earlier, but there's, there's a million stories to be told about the fire support system uh, because it was such a large organization and it evolved so much uh, that it, through these sections of the book, I want to talk about why, why we were fighting at Vimy Ridge uh, mm -hmm. and right. what, what the tools were available to uh, General Morrison, who was the commander of the Corps Artillery, and and what doctrine, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures were in place to use those tools to uh, to uh, to do what they did on Vimy Ridge. Uh, so that's what we'll talk about next. We'll start with ends. So, uh, and I, I didn't include include the, uh, the the quote here, but it's interesting that the overall strategic goal was to to. I know it sounds overly simplistic, but was to kick the Germans out of Belgium and France. And, yep, and yep, yes. I know that's simplistic, but that's it. <laughs> that's, that's what they what wanted was. to do. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, so I can't, I can't make it any prettier than that. That's what they wanted to do. And there's a very, a very famous uh, missive from, uh, uh, from, I believe it was, was it to Hague or from Hague? I think it, or I think it was from Kitchener to Hague just saying, remember, this was the goal is to get yeah. them out of France and, and Belgium. Yeah. Uh, so it was at the Chantilly Conference of November 1916 that they uh, and I mean, they were still fighting the Somme at this point, or at least maybe maybe not. They weren't still, but uh, certainly the echoes of the Somme were still yeah. were still happening, uh, were still reverberating. But uh, they uh, they just discard discard or pardon me decided on the plan uh, for 1917. Uh, they realized that if they were going to win this war, they had to maintain pressure on the Western Front. So they decided we would focus. They would focus their efforts on the on the Western Front, uh, and that's what led to the uh, uh, the 1970 Spring Offensive of uh, the French and the British. Uh, so eventually, that, that's uh, from the strategic level. That's the direction that came down. Uh, and then on the second of January, the concept of operations was issued by uh, British General Headquarters with a one April launch of the Spring Offensive. Uh, and essentially, it was a two-army uh, attack, uh, and that's just the British, but obviously the French had an aspect in this as well. Uh, but the first army was the main effort. Uh, I know it's hard to see there, but you can see the first is in the north under uh, under General Horn, and the south is the third army uh, under uh, under Allenby. So the first uh, the first army was to was to uh, penetrate uh, uh, the, the German line, uh, but Vimy Ridge, and this is why we ended up at Vimy Ridge. Uh, and you can see where it is there uh, under group group Vimy, but Vimy Ridge provided uh, such great uh, observation. Uh, I think most people who's done any study of, of Vimy Ridge, or if anybody stood on Vimy Ridge, you can see the the strategic or I guess operational importance of uh, and tactical importance of Vimy Ridge to be able to see in all directions. It was it was absolutely critical. So uh, that is why 
the third army was a support their their attack was a supporting attack uh in order to kind of eliminate that uh that high ground uh and and uh, to to pin the germans down on, on in their front as well and of the third army attack the canadian corps was the main effort of the third army so it was the main effort of a supporting effort uh but nonetheless it was absolutely critical um and just a little touch, I know uh, in my book, I go into the, how Vimy Ridge kind of changed hands between the French and the British and the, and the Germans, but it, it had been in uh, German hands since, well, at least the Eastern Slope since the, the opening phases of the war. Uh, and then I think it was in the Battle of, the Battle of Artois, or the first or second Battle of Artois, when they, uh, they, they actually attacked over the ridge and, and, and took the, the Western Slope of the ridge. Uh, and uh, the British reattacked a little later, but interesting enough, uh, they had a plan for a major offensive. The British had a major offensive uh, against Vimy Ridge in uh, the spring of 1916, uh, with an attempt to push the Germans off at the very least the western slope of, of Vimy Ridge to hopefully deny them at least the crest or at least the uh, the ability to to to, uh, to see from uh, into the the British back back country. But it was because the amount of artillery that they required for that attack was was so great uh and Haig did not his priority was the Somme so he he didn't authorize the allocation of artillery so you can see at this point even at that point artillery was the key was a key component to any successful attack so it was uh no attack would go in unless it had sufficient artillery uh assigned to support it so when he when he uh, did not allow the artillery to be cut out of the Somme plan to support this attack onto Vimy Ridge, uh, the Vimy Ridge attack just didn't go off. Uh, so it wasn't then again until the spring of 1917 that they actually allocated, they once again grew the artillery arm in the rounds and, and they allocated the artillery to, in this case, the, uh, the Canadian Corps. So that's those are the strategic ends. Uh, and so once again, I won't, I won't belabor the point, but here you see Vimy Ridge uh frontage of 7,000 yards four division assault uh with four tactical objectives the black line the red line the blue line and the brown line and uh, uh i think anybody who's done any reading knows about it so i won't belabor the point but uh it, as was the, the the time or as was as was the doctrine at the time it was essentially a frontal assault there's a little bit nuance to that there were infantry tactics that we won't go into here but fascinating reading if anybody uh, picks up any book uh, books about about uh, how they divided the various waves up by this point uh if at the, at the psalm for example they just got up and walked forward if that was actually the case that wasn't the case by vimy ridge they moved in platoons and they moved in waves and it was a lot more the infantry doctrine was a lot more refined here as well and uh, I touch on that in the book, even though the focus here is uh, is on the artillery. But that was the intent. This, uh, the four Canadian divisions were going to assault over the ridge, and the intent was to actually capture the eastern slope of the ridge as well. Uh, and spoiler alert, we did. Uh, so I don't know if you heard about that, but uh, so we were victorious. Uh, but uh, at this point in the, in the game, that was the plan anyway. All right, so now we get into the meat of it. So means, and I'm not going to talk about all of these things, but when I talk about the means, the tools to the trade, and the millions of different parts, it, there's so many that go into this, whether it's men, projectiles, guns, horses, organizations. So there's nuanced elements of all of this. Uh, for example, when I talk about the, the men that made up the gunners, uh, you know, I talk about how they, they, they were – the recruiting standards were they had to be taller than your average infantier because they were expected to lift the gun or like maneuver the guns and, and they just assumed if you were a bit taller you're probably a bit stronger and you had to lift the lift the shells and whatnot uh projectiles these are all things that uh, uh that, that went into this enormous network uh that all contributed towards uh, the the bombardment of vimy ridge uh, which includes the type of organization. So I just, the next couple of slides are going to hit on some of the uh, the wave tops, the key things. Uh, I do want to stress here, though, the men, it's interesting, they divided, uh, the gunners were, were kind of divided into three categories of uh, gunners. They were the ones that actually operated the gun. Drivers actually sat, they, they drove the horses. So they, uh, if you ever see a casual list or something like that, you see driver so-and-so, they're probably an artillery driver who was who handled a team of horses, and uh, you, you would think that the gun. I thought before I did the study that the gunners did both that they operated the gun right. and they also uh, uh, 
you know, drove the drove the uh, the horses, but that wasn't the case. There were actually drivers who took care of the horses and gunners who took care of the guns, and then there were signalers. So these were the folks who ran the the, the phones, uh, and later in the war, the actual wireless sets, you know, both at the observation post and in the command post and and whatnot. So, uh, but they were all artillerymen. Uh, so there was discussion at the start of the war that uh, they would take signalers from the signals corps. And put yes. them, you know, assigned individually into yeah. the artillery unit. But when they realize that the artillery has its own culture, its own language, uh, and you you can't just take a signal and plug them, plug them, plug them in, and get them to have them understand all the nuances of what we now call fire discipline. Uh, artillery signalers were artillery signalers only. Yeah, it's kind of uh, just quick aside, but it's like in the Second sure. World War when they <laughs> trained. Uh, artillery officers uh, to be pilots instead of the other way around. <laughs> it was just easier to train gunners to be pilots than pilots to be gunners, which yeah, I think is funny. And uh, it's a Scotty, fair point. Yeah. Scotty from Star Trek was one. Uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, Although yeah. he never, I found out the hard way because uh, yeah. a super smart friend of mine pointed out that he he never actually made it to Europe as a AROP pilot. He he did no, his he, training, but uh, the war was over by the time. Uh, probably back. He was a bit ahead, uh, reckless. <laughs> yeah, that's what I heard. <laughs> yeah, anyway, that's a quick aside. Anyway, moving forward. Ah, yes, the 106. Yeah, so some of the key things, um, the 106 views. So it's absolutely amazing how, and I'm not going to read Haig's uh, blurb yeah. here uh, in, in detail, but it's amazing how something that would seem so simple could have yeah. such a revolutionary effect. And that's the next couple slides we're going to talk about, uh, well, at least two of them, about revolutions in military uh, affairs yeah. essentially and the 106 fuse is one of them so as, as we talked at the start this was a siege operation and instead of castle walls though we now had barbed wire so mm -hmm. the wire problem was the key problem that 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 um, uh that 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 really preyed on the minds of the commanders because so so many of the infantry were getting hung up on wires and and of course nobody likes machine guns either uh but once you're hung up on the wire, you can't really, you're stuck there and you're, you're just prey for the machine guns. So they realized getting rid of the wire was key. So our field artillery uh, doing wire cutting uh, it was one of their key tasks. It was to eliminate the wire. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem was, is the, the fuse uh, wasn't sensitive enough. So imagine if you will, uh, a bullet flying at, you know, coming in at 500 meters per second, plus or minus 100 meters per second. Uh, and if it hits this sodden, muddy earth uh, that that all of Flanders and, and uh, Northern Europe had turned into on the battlefields, uh, and of course it doesn't have the resistance, so the, the shell actually digs into the ground quite a bit, even if you have it set to uh, like a, a super quick fuse, like a graze burst, which means as soon as it touches something, it's supposed to burst. Uh, but with an insensitive fuse, it'll bury itself in, it'll explode, so the actual earth eats up a lot of that concussive blast and the shrapnel as well. And sadly, it doesn't cut enough of the, uh, uh, enough of the, uh, of the, of the barbed wire. Uh, but then along came the 106 fuse, uh, which was super sensitive uh, and actually hitting the, the wire would cause it to function. That's how sensitive it was. So this, this round would come in, it would hit uh, barbed wire, cause it to function, uh, almost immediately before it even went into the ground almost. Uh, so it would actually explode within the wire. And so now you have the concussive blast and you have all the shrapnel from the round propagating outwards and actually cutting all the wire. So it eventually became far more effective at cutting that wire. And I think it's a testament here. And this is from Field Marshal Haig's final dispatch in 1918, where, you know, the fact that he went to pains to write about how this yeah. fuse uh, you know, change the way they were doing things really indicates how important uh, an, el uh, an evolution or a revolution uh, we had in, in field artillery here by the use of this fuse. Uh, and as he mentions here, it wasn't until the Battle of Arras, so Vimy Ridge, that they first used the 106 fuse. Maybe not first. I'm sure they used it a couple times before, like uh, in, yeah. in normal rounds. But as a, as a deliberate attack, it was the first time that the 106 was available to actually support a deliberate attack in and the, and the results speak for themselves because uh, uh, in, in almost all of the frontages of all the divisions, the wire was cut perfectly, maybe not perfectly, but sufficient to allow uh, uh, to allow the, the infantry to, to advance. Yep. So that's the yep. 106 fuse. 
Yeah, amazing piece of technology. And yeah. So there we go. It's the 18 pounder gun. So I'll, I'll touch briefly on this. Uh, and, you know, again, to indicate how important this is, and I know you've seen it, if you go to the War Memorial, uh, the, uh, yeah. the, entire, the entire sculpture is all hinged a, a, around uh, a, a, an artillery team towing an 18 pounder. And it's because it was the most numerous of the guns we had. That was the field gun uh, in, uh, well, the, the principal field gun, because there was also 4.5 inch howitzers. Uh, but that was the principal field gun of all the divisional artilleries uh, in, the, in the Imperial Arsenal as well. So British, Australian, New Zealand, you name it, everybody used the 18 pounder. There you see an image of it there that I got from the Canadian War Museum. Uh, it was a child of the South African War. Believe it or not, uh, as they, the Brits and Canadians were, were fighting the Boers in the South African War, uh, the Boers were using German guns that had greater range and greater impact than, uh, than the Imperial artillery. Uh, so they actually, uh, in the middle of the war, uh, they struck a committee to design a new gun, uh, and, they, uh, and they actually plucked battery commanders and brigade commanders yeah. out of out of battle and said, no, you're coming back to the UK and you're going to help us design a new gun because you've been on the receiving end down there. Uh, so that's how important it was. So that was, and eventually it, what resulted was uh, uh, the 18 pounder. It's also a product of the quick fire revolution. So I'll take just a few minutes to talk about this. And yeah. We need to talk about the French Soissons canes. <laughs> and I'm not talking about the uh, orange juice and champagne drink or wh whatever it is. It's the, uh, it's the yeah, as, as nice as that is, uh, it's, I'm talking about the 75 millimeter, uh, uh, gun that the French developed. So, which is named uh, after the, sorry, the drink is named after the gun. It, it is indeed. Yeah, it is indeed. <laughs> uh, and maybe I should have had one while I was, yeah, we should have had one. Ready. Yeah, we should have coordinated. Exactly. Uh, we'll, we'll do this again <laughs> next week and we'll do that. Anyway, the, uh, so the Soissons Canes was designed because after the battle of, uh, or, uh, the, uh, uh Franco-Prussian War of 1870, I beg your pardon. Uh, once again, the, the, the French artillery was outclassed by the German artillery. Uh, so after the, after the war, and the, sorry, after the French lost, they said, well, that's never happened again. Because we have to remember, and it got proved in 1914, to the French, the biggest threat was always the Germans. And uh, so every future war was going to be against the Germans in their mind. So, so they had to, they developed the Soissons Canes, which was a quick fire. Uh, which uh, quick fire simply means, uh, without getting too technical, it has a it has a breach that opens. Uh, usually has a either a fixed bit of ammunition, which is mean it's it's more like a bullet. So like a bullet you would use in a normal rifle or a pistol, in that you don't have to unpluck it and change the charge bags. Sadly, it limits your flexibility because the only way you can adjust uh, or, or alter the range is by changing your elevation. Uh, whereas a howitzer that uses, you know, semi-fix or, or, or separate ammunition, you can change the amount of, of charge bags that you use and then change, you know, change the muzzle velocity and the trajectory. So it's a lot more flexible. But I digress. Going back to the 18-pounder gun, uh, that way, without having to mess around with those charge bags, you can load quicker uh, and the, the breech moves quicker. But it also has a recoil mechanism. Uh, so back in the day, um, interesting bit of artillery culture, uh, if you've ever seen if you've ever seen an infantry parade when the commander comes on to a parade they call the entire parade to attention uh, and in the artillery uh, we don't do that the commander comes on and, and the artillery standing at ease and that's an old tradition that even goes back to Napoleon that uh, the gunners were so tired uh, that he allowed the gunners to to turn over parades and stand in at ease instead of coming to attention and the reason was is there was no recoil mechanism so when the guns fired, the recoil was it actually the whole gun would recoil back you know five ten feet or something like that and then the gunners would have to push it forward reload the gun fire it again it rolls back and they keep going so you ended up with a rate of fire of one two three rounds per minute yeah. uh and then along came the swanson canes which are used a recoil mechanism which essentially what happens again without getting too technical is you fire the shock pushes the barrel the barrel actually slides back it's attached to a piston uh, that, that goes into tubes up and ab above and below the barrel, which f uh, it's filled with a type of liquid uh, that, uh, and there's a, this floating piston that it compresses this liquid by the shock of the, the fire. Uh, so as the barrel pushes, goes back, it f forces that piston forward because they're connected. That, that liquid condenses and then all that energy built up 
pushes the piston back, which pushes the barrel back into place. So you pull the lanyard, it fires, and the barrel slides right back into position for you, and you just load another round. Uh, so the rate of fire then for the small sound canes was like 15 rounds per minute, 20 rounds per minute, much, much faster. Um, uh, but uh, so the French, uh, the French developed that. Uh, ironically, they got the plan f from a German who forgot <laughs> to renew his his patent. Uh, so the patent came came on the market. So they bought it and they uh, they developed this. Uh, the Germans, you know, didn't when they first when the Swanson Canes burst onto the scene in 1999, uh, or sorry, 1899, uh, Bastille, uh, Bastille Day, Bastille Day. Uh, the the Germans looked at it and said, "Well, you know what? We're going to be reducing forts." We want to have this uh, this war for, war of maneuver, uh, so uh, you know that recoil mechanism is just going to break as we as we gallop forward. So we're not going to do it. So, but then once they saw what the Swanson Canes could do, they they got kind of panicky. So they eventually developed their own quick firer, uh, but it never reached the, the rate of fire of the Swanson Canes, or in this case, the eighteen pounder. So uh, that was a long way to say the eighteen pounder was influenced by that. Uh, quick uh, quick fire revolution. So as you can see, it includes a recoil mechanism. So it was a quick firer, uh, and uh, and it had a, a similar rate of fire to the to the Swasson case. And as I mentioned, it was the principal artillery piece in the divisional artillery. And finally, just just for everybody's uh, information, how things were organized. Uh, so Canadian divisional artillery was commanded by a brigadier general. Uh, each Canadian divisional artillery had three brigades. So up until I think 1940, maybe 39, I can't remember the exact, we referred to what is now a regiment, uh, so a unit size, like a battalion. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, so we call them now in the artillery, we call them a regiment. But up until late 30s, we called them brigades, yep. uh, which of course got confusing because there'd be a brigade <laughs> of infantry, which is uh, the next level up from a battalion, but we called an artillery what would be an artillery battalion in, let's say, the American Army? We called them a brigade of artillery. So, uh, so each uh, each CDA had three brigades, uh, and each brigade had three batteries of six 18 pounders and one battery of six four and a half inch uh, guns. So that was what a uh, an artillery brigade is. So if you ever hear of like First Canadian Field Artillery Brigade, uh, some people think you're talking about three battalions, but it's not. In the First World War, it was only, it was a single battalion, or what we would say now as a regiment. Interesting, before uh, the Somme, the organization was, uh, each uh, CDA had um, four, four brigades yes. uh, uh, with uh, four gun batteries. Yep. Uh, so four brigades of, of, of three uh, uh, of three batteries of, of four and and one four gun four four and a half four gun four and a half inch battery, uh, but the casualties in the Somme were so bad they didn't have enough officers to command that many subunits. So that's why they adopted this. Uh, you know, instead of four four eighteen pounder batteries, there were now three. So same number of guns. Uh, they just distributed the guns into three subunits instead of four, uh, yeah. but they didn't have enough majors to command those those batteries. So they uh, that's how they changed it. And interesting enough, doctrinally, that's still the number of guns we're still we're supposed to have in a battery now. Although in the Second World War, it went to eight guns, uh, two troops of four. Yeah. All right. So we've already talked about this a little bit, but uh, I'll rehash it. So talking now about tactics, techniques, and procedures. Once again, the, the first phases of the war were the phase of uh, what um, uh, McNaughton wrote in, in his notes and also uh, uh, General uh, Bailey, who wrote the uh, uh, Field Artillery and Firepower. If you don't have that book, pick it up. If you want to talk about dense artillery study, historical yeah. study, that is it. Yeah. Like the number, I mean, most of his pages are, are this much text and then that much footnotes. I know. It's just I, these weird historical notes. I picked uh, up a copy once at the War Museum just to look at and I'm like, yeah. ah, <laughs> this is pretty impenetrable. Yeah, it's a it's a it's an it's a magnum opus for him for sure. But it, it is just chock full of information. Anyway, they both both he and would not refer to artillery maneuver, which was the opening phases we discussed, uh, which uh, was again uh, guns firing over open sites, galloping into uh, uncovered positions. Uh, but what we see in the spring of 1917 is the phase of artillery destruction, uh, where we now have the guns and the rounds to 
destroy uh, the target and el eliminate it to facilitate infantry advance. Uh, so in March 1917, uh, artillery notes uh, number four, I think it was called. I apologize, I forget the number. Okay. Artillery in the offense in in offensive operations. Apologize for the spelling mistake there, or the the added word. Artillery in offensive operations uh, came out, which guided how artillery is to be used in offensive operations. So it was essentially the playbook for Vimy Ridge in the spring offensive of 1917. Uh, and, and it consisted of these five elements, the preliminary bombardment, counter battery, physical and moral reduction of the enemy, destruction of material and support to the assault. So those are all elements of the use of the artillery in the offensive operations. So that is what guided Morrison and all the gunners of the Canadian Corps artillery as to how they crafted the, uh, uh, the actual fire plan to support it. Uh, and because we are now in the phase of artillery destruction, you, you see these long, long uh, preliminary bombardments. So the preliminary bombardment of uh, Vimy Ridge started 20 days before uh, before Z, Z, zero day or Z day, uh, and it was just this 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 eventual destruction of everything. It was it was all about removing or killing Germans and and removing their uh, removing the wire, uh, and of course counter battery is key. So the great uh, artillery duel uh, that uh, that Napoleon first uh, espoused uh, was still in place, but now from indirect fire positions, uh, physical and moral reduction of the enemy destruction of material and that material is could be machine guns it could be it was other things like uh uh junction boxes or, or uh, yeah. like telephone exchanges Which even is... water pipes anything that would uh help to isolate the enemy and then of course supports of the assault which is the brigade so those are that was the artillery philosophy the way of doing artillery uh in april 1917. Uh, so taking that, uh, Morrison and his crew sat down and they said, all right, let's dev develop a fire plan. And, and here it is. So this is what uh, uh, what Morrison AL de developed. Uh, so it was it was divided into four phases. Phase one was that initial preparatory fire. As I mentioned, it started at Z minus 20 and then went to Z minus seven, uh, in which case destruction of trenches and cutting wire was priority, but also counter battery. Uh, but, and we, we touched on this in Veritable, it's amazing how much, uh, like the rule, not, not the rules, but the philosophy of the doctrine kind of came back into vogue for Veritable, yeah. a large bombardment. Uh, True, but, uh, but there was an art to counter battery, not just finding the enemy, but hitting the enemy and, and, and not always hitting them right away. Uh, so there were times where there was orders that you were not allowed to fire back at the yeah. German batteries because they would they would move or it would disclose dis or disclose Canadian gun locations uh, or they would want them actually neutralized in coordination with other events. Uh, so so like I said, there's a bit of an art to it, but so that was phase one, uh, and throughout that they slowly increased. Uh, they slowly increased the amount of fire they were they were delivering against the Germans, and then Z minus uh, six. The 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 se April second was when this started. Uh, I know most people are saying, "Well, the attack went in on the ninth. Why are you calling uh, April second uh, Z minus six? A lot of people don't know that there was a delay imposed. So the French weren't quite ready. They asked for a delay. Uh, so the original uh, zero day or Z day of the attack on Vimy Ridge was supposed to be April eighth, but it was delayed to the ninth. So uh, Morrison got an extra day of, uh, of shooting at them before they actually crossed the line of Archer. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Z minus six to Z minus one was the plan for this intensified preparatory fire. During this time, there was a massive increase in the number of rounds fire. This included the destruction of villages. So there were certain villages uh, that were identified uh, on the ridge, Talis, uh, a few others, uh, that they were just to be obliterated. Uh, and this is what I know, this has become a pretty famous quote from the Germans, but the week of suffering. So when you hear them referring to the week of suffering, it's that Z minus six to Z uh, week of intensified preparatory fire that the Canadian Corps undertook uh, to, uh, uh, to wear down the Germans. Um, and so once they've worn them down on, Z, on zero day on Z day, it all started in phase three with support to the assault. So at that point, the barrage went into place. So there was a, uh, a four minute pause, I believe, uh, 
uh, at, at 420 or 526, I think, or maybe it was just a couple of minutes or something. Three like and that. a half. I don't know. You do you you have it in the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's this there was, specific. Yeah. Yeah. There was this weird pause of a couple minutes. Yeah. And and a lot of a lot of firsthand accounts from it will say there was this for the first time in three weeks, there was this eerie wow. silence. Yeah. fell over the battlefield because no artillery was fired and it was only for a matter of one or two minutes yeah, and really then long. all hell ro uh, broke loose yeah. and the barrage fired and it was a creeping barrage so uh what you see on the map there yeah. is is the barrage line so imagine if you will uh this map was drawn up kind of at core headquarters uh it goes to all, all of the divisional artilleries who then break down those lanes that you see and assign different brigades to those lanes. Uh, they, they, each brigade got assigned a lane in that kind of divisional lane. And then in the brigade command post, they assign the batteries uh, yeah. to, those, to those lanes. Uh, and then now you have your poor lieutenant artillery officer in the command post, uh, you know, for, for days kind of making calculations, okay, well, to fire on this line. But, so it's a very intense and, and, and you understand why in effective barrage, you needed time to do it. You needed days to plan it because all of that had to trickle down uh, until finally the, the battery command post would produce a document for the gun detachment commander. Or at, at the time, we call, we call them detachments now. They were called uh, subs at the time, referring to subsections because the section was two guns. Uh, so one gun was a sub and it was A sub, another one was B sub. Uh, and uh, the the sergeant in command would get this sheet and telling them exactly the time to fire and what to fire, what elevation, what bearing, and uh, he would just follow it. And uh, you know, we're, it's lost on a lot of people that uh, the gunners um, for these twenty days that they were firing, they were living out of their their gun pit. So uh, you know, it may it certainly sucked for the Germans who were on the receiving end. Uh, but if anybody's tried to sleep next to a firing gun, uh, one can imagine it's not it's not that easy. I mean, eventually, you get so tired you can fall asleep. But uh, in, in this in this particular case, for 20 days, none of them got a moment's rest because there was always a gun going off at some point. Uh, and then after from Z minus six, it was just this constant drumbeat of artillery fire. Uh, so uh, you know, while well, some of the infantry were to the rear and doing rehearsals or whatnot, maybe not. These, these chaps were lying in the gun pet right next to their gun. Maybe someone got back to the wagon lines or something for a bit of a rest, but uh, constantly surrounded by boom, boom, boom. And so the, the joke about gunners being deaf, you, you can understand where it, where it comes from. Uh, and uh, just imagine being exposed to that. Uh, so anyway, I digress. The barrage goes forward uh, and, and the, the barrage rolled forward. So it's it wasn't just a single line. There were... Uh, there were the creeping barrages, so they went forward at 100 yard lifts, uh, and uh, they timed it to be the lifts were about four minutes, and I, the doctrinal lifts were were doctrinally it was supposed to be about three minutes, which incidentally we still teach today. That is the same kind of rate of planning figure we teach, uh, you know, 100 100 meters for every three minutes, uh, and um, for dismounted advance. Uh, but they used four minutes here, and I presume because they, they anticipated the uh, uh, the ground would be churned up and the infantry wouldn't be moving as fast, uh, but also they were going uphill, so they were going to be moving a little bit slower. Uh, but also it was, it was a lot more deliberate. So they, uh, so that was the creeping barrage. Uh, so the 18-pounders would be there, and then you know maybe uh, 50 to 100 yards in front of that uh, would be the 60-pounders 60, uh, 60 and six inches. Uh, and then the heavier guns would also, they would fire standing barrage. So standing barrage is just a wall of fire. So um, essentially what would happen is when the barrage started, you had that creeping barrage that would start 200 yards or so in front of the infantry start line. Uh, but then also the heavier guns were firing on these lines, on these the, the trench lines and, and whatnot. So as the, the creeper barrage kind of moved forward and lifts, it would join these objectives where there was a standing barrage who was just instead of moving, was pounding it constantly. Uh, and then once the barrage joined with it, the whole thing would move forward yeah. after a pause. Uh, and I I know I'm, I'm exposing my artillery geekiness here, but I think that's a thing of beauty to be able to actually coordinate that. Yeah. And, you know, you would have a creeper barrage and then they would both move forward. And then when they hit the next standing barrage, 
all of them creep forward together. And by the time you get to the end of this, you have this massive barrage rolling forward. Uh, and, uh, and, and you can understand why we're successful uh, and, and how uh, artillery enabled the, the, the advance of the infantry in, in this particular case. I, I do think I need to pause here and mention uh, I, as, as important as I feel the artillery was to hear, I, I don't, I'm not trying to denigrate the infantry at all. So if there's any infantiers who are <laughs> crafting angry emails to me or anything, you, you know, the, the infantry, as I said, they had developed their own tactics. They were being a lot more effective and they were the ones getting shot at, uh, you know, there, we took plenty of casualties. It was successful, but it was by no means a bloodless conquest conquest on our side. So, uh, the, the infantry had to, uh, uh, they still had to, uh, you know, clear out those those pits and clear out the trenches. Uh, so the artillery enabled them, but they were still bayoneting people and and, and facing death around every corner. There we go. I appreciate that, Pat G. <laughs> <laughs> just let that sit for a second. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just to give you a break for a second. It's I agree. It's it's the it's the amount of planning. It's having everything go correctly ish to plan, mm -hmm. but having all of that coming together. I mean. Again, I don't want to go on the whole Vimy thing, but it, it it it's important in and of itself for that. It doesn't have to be this whole nation defining thing. It can be important mm -hmm. for that for bringing this all together. Because as we've spent the last what, an hour and a bit now, it, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a yeah. lot new, and it's a lot of learning. So I think in that and of itself should be impressive enough. But mm -hmm. I digress there. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, yeah, exactly. Thanks very much for that. I did need to, I need to I did need to come up for breath there for a moment. I appreciate it. Uh, so the final phase is the forward movement of the guns. So at this point, the, the artillery obviously has range, but not not a heck of a lot. So no. we the if we wanted to prosecute targets in depth, uh, beyond kind of the the final uh, objective there, we had to move guns forward. So uh, and of course we just churned up the entire ground. So bringing guns forward was always a was always a challenge. Uh, and in some cases, uh, I, I read of one that I mentioned in the book, it, it took, uh, uh, I, I think it took one brigade, something like three or four days to move a kilometer, yeah. you know, because it, a lot of these, you literally have horses dying from exhaustion. We have men who are physically pushing guns because uh, uh, the roads are so horrible. Uh, one, one brigade, I think it was third brigade, uh, stood out uh, because the commander, maybe it was first brigade, uh, did an awful lot of re uh, reconnaissance yeah. and choosing routes and yeah. and kind of leaned forward and had bridges built beforehand, more right. bridges than he needed. Uh, and uh, and one of the, the the key officers in charge of that plan was General Carrar, who would of course be uh, commander of first Canadian Army uh, during Operation Veritable. So uh, he was. He was out there planning the, the advance route for the guns. But, uh, and that's, that's something, you know, you hear about how the horses would, uh, horses suffered horribly during this. Oh, yeah. uh, but just the, the sheer effort it took the Canadian gunners to get their guns forward. Uh, yeah. and, and we may have won, but we, we also need to, we did win. But we have to remember that the Germans knew uh, very precisely where all of their own trench lines were. Yeah. So, uh, so, once the Germans reestablished themselves and were firing back and counterattacking, their fire onto their own positions were, was quite accurate, obviously. They knew oh, yeah. where they were. So as the gunners, uh, and they had, they had, you know, for two years, developed a, a understanding of where the routes were and everything on the ridge. Uh, so uh, the Canadian gunners and the, the Canadian infantry were holding the ridge. Uh, you know, had to do so at a great personal cost because there was certainly a lot of German fire coming back their way uh, exactly. as well. Uh, but yeah, over the next couple of days, the, the gunners moved the guns forward so that they could start engaging targets in depth. And so, so there it is. Uh, uh, it was quite the organization. Um, 624 field guns, 224 heavy guns. So here we're, we're 850 so guns. And then trench mortars probably pushing it up close to... Uh, uh, uh yeah. the, up close to a thousand or so uh, and then over forty-five thousand men canadian british south african uh there was even a royal naval a yes. royal navy divisional artillery in there so these poor sailors who uh wow. thought they were <laughs> yeah. kind of yeah i mean the royal yeah. naval stuff yes but 
kind of they knew what they were getting into. Is what I'm yeah, saying. they knew. Okay, yeah. <laughs> they knew what the deal. But was. nonetheless, yeah, yeah. So they're out there slogging away, and uh, uh, so that's how the Canadian Corps artillery was divided. As I mentioned, there was a uh, so if you look at the all those symbols that you see, there are all brigades. Uh, so as we mentioned earlier. Each divisional artillery normally has three brigades, but here you can see how many brigades are allocated to each of the uh, to each of the divisions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so more so than there there are three. And as I mentioned, for every one Canadian brigade, there was three, four, maybe even five British brigades that were supporting the division. Uh, so once again, you know, if if you're looking for for grist for the argument that this wasn't the all Canadian show that we tried to sell it, uh, the 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 probably the, the majority of the, at least the, the core artillery was British uh, mm -hmm. in, in nature. Uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, they, so that was the, the intimate support that you see there in the, the field uh, brigades up top. Uh, but then, and weirdly, we have these two brigadier generals. So there was the, the uh, General Officer Command Royal Artillery Canadian Corps, who was Morrison. Uh, he was the overall commander, but there was another brigadier general uh, who was the General Officer Commanding Heavy Artillery. And you can see yeah. him, Below, so he commanded uh, the heavy artillery, and in this case, uh, the heavy artillery div was divided into four heavy double groups, each supporting one of the divisional frontages, uh, and then three counter battery groups. So even though he wasn't, and I know that we tend to get leg uh, legalistic about what it means to command an organization, yeah. but uh, that CBSO you see there, the Canadian, or sorry, Canadian, the counter battery staff officer was none other than General McNaughton, who would uh, go on to do great things. Uh, and, and even though he wasn't necessarily in command of those counter battery groups, uh, he nonetheless had executive authority to tell them where and when to fire. Uh, and of course, it became a, uh, uh, a, uh, a, a piece of art in its own right, uh, uh -huh. because I'll, I'll just digress a bit here because I didn't touch on it earlier, but uh, the counter battery system by this point, uh, because we now were faced with the problem of not being able to see the enemy artillery, we had to find them somewhere, uh, somehow, pardon me. So uh, airplane observation was important, but we also developed sound ranging. And by we, I don't mean Canadians necessarily, but you know the, the, the gunners at the time. Uh, sound ranging, which was absolutely fascinating, where microphones would be deployed. Uh, and when uh, an enemy gun would fire, uh, they would calculate when the, the sound waves, I know there's probably some locating uh, gunners listening maybe who are going to pick me up on some technical errors that I'm making, <laughs> but in general, the sound waves would propagate over the, uh, uh, throughout the ground, and as the microphone picked it up, uh, they would time when, they, uh, when those microphones picked it up, and you would be able to triangulate from that uh, mm -hmm. where the, the actual sound came from. And it was the same with flash spotting. You would have observers out there when the, an enemy... Uh, battery would fire. They would lay their their instruments on that. Uh, if they fired again, they would uh, uh, they would uh, they would report what they saw, and they would report those bearings. And in the CBSO office, they would be able to triangulate uh, those bearings and and down to like five, ten, fifteen feet of a gun, they would be able to locate enemy batteries. So this whole system of counter battery was developed and and and, and became quite effective uh, at it. And uh, as I said, uh, General McNaughton was, uh, well, he, Lieutenant Colonel McNaughton at the time, was uh, uh, was uh, was coordinating the engagement of all, all these batteries, all under the uh, the command of the General Officer Command and Heavy Artillery uh, in the Canadian Corps. Yeah, he but was, that was, as you can see, it was a massive organization. Yeah, yeah. So I was just going to say McNaughton was definitely in his wheelhouse. <laughs> mm -hmm. Doing counter battery, whether he was later on is uh, for debate. But I think he was in his wheelhouse here for sure. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So, uh, and I know it's just an org chart, uh, and it doesn't. If you when you buy the book uh, for everybody <laughs> watching, you know, uh, it, I, I go into kind of the elements of all of those batteries. So, yep. you know, sometimes we we just see a square with a dot in the middle of it. Okay, battery, but that battery has has a gun line, has has ops has wagon lines, has horse lines, ammunition resupply. Each one of those uh, divisional artilleries has a divisional artillery column who's bringing ammo forward and dumping it at the gun. All of those guns need to be dug in. Everybody needs to be uh, camouflaged. Uh, and with a frontage of 7,000 meters, 800 guns, where do you put 800 guns? 
And uh, so that's the problem that, uh, again, that, that we had variable as well, uh, yes, finding, yeah. you know, it seemed almost every tree out there had a gun hiding behind it or something like that because uh, you had to tuck them away somewhere. All right. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't dwell on execution much here because we, we already did. Oops. So my 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 uh, electricity is flickered. So who knows if we'll we'll still be on in ten minutes or not? Uh, but anyway, I'm still here. The uh, uh, it obviously it was a success, uh, and and I think we know that the artillery uh, was a big part of that success. Yeah. Uh, and this is just a quote from the commander of 70, 79th uh, Reserve Infantry Regiment, who was on the receiving end of it. Uh, again, I won't uh, I won't read it uh, in in great detail here. Um, do I have it in the next slide? Can you go to the next slide? I... Yeah, sorry. No, okay. If you yeah, if you go back to that one, sorry. There's a great quote which I was going to include, but I obviously forgot uh, where. Um, the Germans, the, the frontline Germans were so isolated by the end of it. Oh, uh, yes. yes. That they, you know, they uh, they couldn't, the Germans could not even bring forward, not just ammunition for them, mm -hmm. uh, like small arms ammunition and whatnot, but they couldn't get them food or water. Yeah. So for, especially during that week of suffering, they were completely isolated. Uh, They're living in their trenches under constant bombardment. Uh, no fresh water. They were, and, and Dietrich writes about how, the only water they could get, they had to scoop out of uh, puddles right. that were contaminated with gas and feces. Yeah. Uh, and of course, all the uh, the bread was all moldy and everything like that. But so that is the physical and moral reduction of the enemy. It's not just it's not always just about killing the enemy, but it's also about eliminate uh, like reducing his morale, making him feel like he's he's not supported, he's isolated, uh, and that's what that massive bombardment achieved there. Massive, yeah, yeah. I think I was just going to say real quick that is. Um, something that sticks to me is the non, you know, <laughs> military uh, professional is, is that what is left from the German sources is a, the suffering, literally, because the week of suffering, I think it just sums it up so well. I think that's why it's, it's so catchy, but it's, it sums it up because that's how effective it was. Yeah, just certainly. literally, like you mentioned earlier, destroying those, um, the crossroads of the trenches and things like that. Couldn't go anywhere half the time. They literally, I remember mm -hmm. being some, they try to go outside and then just fire and they, they see nothing but destruction and they just go back into the yeah. dugout because what else can you do? It's, uh, it, it's quite striking. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I can get up to the, uh, conclusion here. Yeah. So, you know, and I know there's a, there's a, a big debate about whether this was a nation building experience or not. And I, I, I touch on it. I don't, I don't necessarily come down on one side or the other uh, of what's, whether it was, but something that resonated with me is at least from an artillery perspective, yeah. uh, we yeah. got this impression that something happened something. Uh, and, uh, and it's something bigger that it was more than just a big bombardment. Uh, so this, this is the Telus monument, which is, to my knowledge, and I, I'm, uh, if Dave Patterson's out there, I'm sure he'll correct me if I'm wrong. But to my knowledge, I think it's the only artillery Canadian artillery memorial in, uh, of the First World War. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, it's specifically dedicated to Vimy, though, and there might be other memorials. Yeah. But, but nonetheless, as you can see, it was unveiled in February 1918. So we're only talking nine months uh, after yeah. after the battle. So obviously, in the contemporary mind. There was something about what happened here, and I understand we can make we can have historical arguments about whether Vimy Ridge, you know, we 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 kind of became a nation on that day, and I understand it's hard to to break something down into one event. Says, well, you know, on yeah. April eighth we were the Dominion of Canada, on yeah. April 9th, we were Canada. Yeah. I don't know, you know, uh, others can have that fight, but certainly and especially amongst the gunners, which is what we're talking about here, there was a feeling something big happened here, yeah. uh, which uh, necess not necessitated, but led to the creation of this, uh, uh, of, this uh, of this memorial, which is a beautiful memorial, and it's still there. I got to see it when I went to Vimy Ridge in 19, or sorry, uh, 2017 for the centennial. Uh, but uh, again, to rehash my thesis, the spring offensive was the first time they always had enough guns, men, bullets, the right the effective fuses and effective centralized command and control uh, to be able to return a modicum of maneuver to the battlefield. Uh, as I mentioned, something of note happened. Uh, and whether or not it was this big nation building event or not, others can fight over that. But something happened there uh, that was uh, out of the or uh, out of the the ordinary and, and needed to be recognized. Uh, but you know, a lot of people kind of conflate 
Vimy Ridge with the victory in the war. And, you know, there was a lot of fighting still to come. You know, this was April 1917. And as you know, the war didn't end until November 1918. So it was, uh, I think if my math is correct, 19 months or something like that, of more of fighting that, that goes on. But uh, as a bit of an epilogue, eventually, it probably, uh, eventually we got to the point where we, we migrated out of the, the phase of artillery destruction to artillery right. neutralization. Yeah. So eventually people who were nervous about the newfangled predicted fire plans that people were proposing, <laughs> even at Vimy Ridge, eventually said, okay, let's give it a try. Uh, and they realized, uh, well, we don't need 20 days of preliminary bombardment. Yeah. If, we trust, uh, if we trust in our equipment and we hit them up front really, really quickly, we can neutralize them uh, and then exploit that. So by the time we hit the 100 days, we're now in the period of artillery neutralization. Uh, and um, and it's no longer these long uh, preliminary bombardments. They're still preliminary bombardments, but it's nowhere near the duration that we see yeah. in Vimy Ridge. They're a lot more sh uh, shorter and to the point. Uh, and uh, predicted fires uses a lot more other than uh, adjusted fire. Uh, so, But yep. to break that stalemate of the first uh, the first uh, you know, two years or so of of, uh, of static warfare, trench warfare, siege warfare. Uh, it, by spring 1917, all the parts were in place to uh, to enable artillery destruction and return some degree of maneuver to the battlefield. Yep. Yeah, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention use some gas as well as that was forward, <laughs> uh, yeah. particularly in 100 days. But that could be something else for another time. So okay. yeah, that's. Uh, I think is there one more. Uh, yep, there's one more. This is the, uh, of course there we go. <laughs> this is the plug. Yeah, sorry, shameless, <laughs> shameless self promotion. Uh, yeah, so uh, pick up my book. Uh, you, you'll enjoy it. It's uh, the book launch is nine April. Uh, the Kindle uh, is available for pre order now. Uh, you pick it up at Amazon. It's been published by Phil and the gang over at uh, Double Dagger Books. Uh, and uh, like I said, I had, uh, this is a, a work that uh, I started writing this in 19, 19, 2016 uh, <laughs> with the intent uh, I was going to have this published in time for the uh, cent centennial in uh, 2017. Of course, that uh, obviously didn't happen. So, yeah. so here we are. And uh, I hope uh, those who, who, who want to pick it up will enjoy it. It's not, it's not impenetrably dense from an artillery perspective. But no. I do get into some tips technical elements from time to time. Uh, but uh, I, I try to, uh, to, to use a, a layman's terms as much as possible. Uh, I, I never put my IG hat on when I was writing it. So I, <laughs> I didn't have that uh, bear, bearing down on me. But uh, yeah, thanks for having me. It was great, great fun talking about it. And uh, I hope uh, anyone who does decide they want to pick up the book will enjoy it and send me any notes, uh, positive or negative, uh, <laughs> going forward. Well, yeah, just so everyone knows watching now and later, um, if you're watching now, I've linked the ebook down below because it is available. I checked earlier this afternoon. I was going to buy a copy, but I want a physical copy, so I'm going to wait. <laughs> I almost got to click, but I'm like, no, I want a, I want a physical copy because I've already read the, the e-copy. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's this link down below. Uh, and then if you're watching later, I will uh, link the physical copy when it comes out to this, and I'm sure I'll, I'll share it a ton because, uh, yes, of course, I get a little bit, but... Uh, I want your work out there because I know how good it is. Um, oh, well, thanks. Yeah, sure. and just before we can do a quick log off here, I want to say, yeah, the technical stuff. I'm not a technical person. Mm -hmm. Maybe I fake it sometimes, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> like, I struggle. Um, <laughs> so the way you did it, I mean, obviously, I have the military history background, but I don't have a technical background, really. So I, I didn't find it impenetrable. Sorry, I found a way in, no problem. I didn't wasn't confused. You didn't like mm -hmm. start good. busting out trigonometry and stuff that I don't understand and all that. So. If anyone's worried about that, which shouldn't be, this is a great overview of artillery generally. So even if you're just an artillery you know, fan or want to learn more, this is the way to go. Uh, and Dave and Dave, come in to save us, as he always does, is uh, the there only one. So, yeah. Uh, if you don't that's, mind, as, that's an as authoritative uh, a source as you're ever going to find. So Yeah, I just let him do it. <laughs> <laughs> I know if I say it, I'll probably be wrong or I'll say something stupid. Just let Dave do his thing. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick, where did it go? Uh, everyone's uh, enjoying. Uh, will there be a launch signing or anything of that nature at some point? Uh, yeah, we're, so we're, I, I'm kind of looking at things that, you know, I've got this job that wants me to do stuff, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, so you sadly, that, right? yeah. yeah, next few weeks are going to be um, 
uh, going to be pretty busy. So I'm, I'm thinking of it uh, now. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably looking late April, maybe early May. We're thinking maybe the uh, uh, the Army officers' mess might have a little get together there. Uh, the, the folks at Double Dagger tell me that book uh, uh, book launches are more of a party to celebrate having come through this kind of crucible of producing something. Uh, and uh, but yeah, I'm I'm down with having a launch and uh, and signing. So stay tuned and uh, and I'll get it out there. Uh, but right now I've got nothing firm planned. But uh, yeah. Well, if uh, if those become more firm, let me know. Uh, I will. Yeah, I will yeah. uh, bombard people. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So that's good. So thanks everyone uh, for coming out and for watching. Um, yeah. So it's just everyone seems to be enjoying it. Good event for oh artillery day. That's a good point. Um, that could work. That is a good point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm just thinking about the other comments here. People are talking about math, and it gets my head kind of messed up because I, I hate math. <laughs> just like Norma, it doesn't give me a stomach ache. It gives me a headache because I'm just like, I just have bad flashbacks in high school and not doing so good with the math, going back to the technical thing. So, yeah. So, uh, je dois, je dois yeah. dire just uh, merci à Gagne, uh, Catherine Gagnon pour les, uh, les mots concernant uh, uh, mon français. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> I, did I even say anything French? I said, soit sans quinze. Uh, I said Bastille, but I did I actually use French? I don't recall. Did. No. <laughs> she seems yeah. to think so. <laughs> hey, take the compliment, right? Uh, yeah, so everyone enjoyed it. So thanks for coming on. I always do a good job. Uh, did, so. Sorry, just wanted to, I, I apologize. Just want to add Catherine Gagnon's a, manager, a member of our uh, RCAA team. She's the editor of our RCAA uh, newsletter. Uh, great lady. Good to see oh, you on here, Catherine. Yeah, everyone's uh, got more people jumping in saying uh, thanks for uh, well-pronounced words. So there you go. <laughs> Literally, there you go. It can't be that. Um, I hope to uh, I hope to uh, hear uh, that from someone at some point as my French slowly, slowly, <laughs> slowly, slowly improves. And now I'm sort of getting in slightly insulted, which I am completely okay with because it's 100% accurate. <laughs> I am not technical. I, oh, I have trouble. The math just, oh, I pull up the calculator for 7 plus 4, so... <laughs> you can count on that as much as you like. But yeah, so thanks again for coming out and the book. I mean, I'm singing the praises because your books are great and uh, Falcon's book was great and this is a good one. Uh, I'm hoping you get the, the again, this is just me saying this. He did not pay me to say any of this, people. <laughs> I hope it gets the, the exposure that it deserves. A, because again, I, I as I think about these things just real quick, it's it's a Canadian story and sometimes that puts people off. I'm just going to say it out directly. Some, I'm sure you've you have sort of the same sense that just happens. People always, always just Canadians don't want to hear about it. This has got more to it. Yes, it's about a Canadian story, even though we said it's actually technically the artillery part is mostly British. <laughs> technically, um, but it, it's got more to it, right? You've you've broken down the organization. You've broken down things like you've describing like the supply lines. I was just mm -hmm. like, this is fascinating. I'm like, I didn't know it in this detail. Now I do. So it's just, that's why it's great. Like talking about like the, the supply lines, the horse lines, the guys going back for a couple of days of rest and what that means and how that literally looks. I mean, sorry, I'm just going to mm -hmm. keep going on, but it's a great book. So everyone check it out. Get the copy now if you want the e-copy. Even coming out the ninth, I'll be linking that thing like crazy and probably getting my own. Uh, yeah. So other than that, uh, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, if you aren't already, consider becoming a patron or YouTube channel member. Every little bit helps me to keep doing these things. The more support I get on there, the more I can do this and get more people like Dave doing excellent work on the channel. So uh, what's coming up? I'm doing an AMA on Vimy. We're going to get into some of the stuff. I assume it's going to people are going to have opinions and that's fine and that's great and bring them out. So that'll be Friday afternoon. I don't know if people have it off. Um, it's the only time that worked for me, unfortunately. And there's a video on Vimy coming out this weekend. So uh, a lot of Vimy stuff. This is a good nice. kickoff, Dave. So thanks for... Uh, starting us off strong. So other than that, uh, I'll see everybody who can make it on Friday. And if you have any questions, anything you want me to answer, uh, shoot me a message and I can get them on the show as well. So other than that, uh, everyone enjoy the rest of your evening and I'll see you next time. Bye everyone. <laughs>